technology. I'm Joya Cundy, and if you will silence your cell phone, turn on your T-coil, I have a couple announcements for you this morning. First of all, you all had an ACES brochure on your chair this morning. Uh, the ACES Adult Community Exploration Series is a partnership between the college and the um, Community Education Council. It is it takes eight weeks in the summertime. We have four courses taught by college professors. Each course is two classes. And you can sign up uh, on the, the brochure that you have. Uh, you also see that there's a phone number you can call, if you prefer, or an email address. Uh, if you do decide to sign up, uh, you can just tear that flap off and leave it on the table, and I'll take care of it for you. Those classes meet on Wednesday mornings from 10 to 11.30, right here in, in this very room, so you won't get too far out of the habit. <laughs> uh, the other announcement I have is bad news and good news and good news and good news. The bad news is that Ann won't be here next week to teach the fourth course. Uh, however, the good news is that we will make up that course, that class, so at another time, so you won't miss out on it. And the really good news is that the reason he won't be here is because Dan and Kim, uh, Jill will be going to Washington, D.C. to start spoiling their brand new grandson. <laughs> The other good news is that we have a replacement but next week, so we will still have class. Byron uh, Huffle Worley will be here to show you bunches of pictures on the, the cyclone that came through Grinnell in 1882. So we will still keep the theme of Grinnell history, and I think that's going to be very interesting to see. But now, let's go on with the third class of Van Kaiser's class, of course, on uh, Grinnell history, Grinnell a century ago. Please welcome Grandpa Kaiser. <laughs> Thank you. It appears that I'm taller than when you last saw me. It's because my feet are not on the ground. <laughs> I'm floating a little high. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, the flexibility of the committee in allowing me to uh, dodge the last course so I can get my arms around, around my grandson. I'm very excited about it. Uh, and I, I don't want to forget the, the, to thank the committee and to thank all of you as well for giving me this chance to talk about some stuff that's, as I said, the kind of hobby, a preoccupation plan rather than a, a profession. And you've been very kind about it, and I'm, I'm very grateful. I should say, as I should have said each time, I guess, that the only reason I can talk about these things is because we're the beneficiaries of those people who have taken the time to collect and to preserve those materials that I've been spending some time looking through, and, and we're very lucky to have that. I'm, I'm thinking about the Dory Lalonde, who takes charge of the local history room here in the library. Uh, Cheryl, New Cheryl uh, Newbert in the back, who's a volunteer there. Um, some of you may also be aware of the Palachik History Preservation Project. If you're tuned in on, on Facebook, you know that they publish pictures from time to time. They scan these materials, which make them available uh, to all of us. Uh, the digital Grinnell stores most of those things. The college makes uh, server space available and so on. There, there are many more ways that the museum, uh, lots of ways in which preserving these records makes it possible for us to uh, look at things that, and to gain this kind of perspective that we've been talking about. So, uh, so I'm very grateful. I wanted to, you remember we've talked about how each time, uh, you know, have some fun. I hope we'll have some fun again uh, today. Um, get some perspective and also some discovery. And uh, before you today is a little bit of discovery, at least it's a discovery for me, and maybe for many of you. Uh, I only, I'm not the real discoverer, and actually Emily Fitch and myself come in, but I don't see where she is right now. Emily, where are you? There she is, three quarters of the way back. Emily and John, some time ago, were in Paris at a train station, where you can read this on the college website, I stumbled across at one point. They were in Paris and they saw a woman adjacent to them with some bags, and while they waited for the train, they exchanged a little bit of conversation. Turns out the woman spoke English too. 
And she wanted to know, where did you people come from? And they said, well, we come from Iowa, a little, little town in Iowa. She said, well, where? Where am I? Grinnell, Iowa. She said, I grew up in Grinnell, Iowa. <laughs> And the even better part of this story is, she was the mother of Joan Baez. Joan Santos Baez, as, as I guess she became. This is Joan Baez's grandfather. William, I should say, the Reverend uh, William, uh, do I have the whole here, yes? Reverend William Bridge, born in 1884 uh, in London served for a time in an Episcopal parish in uh, Scotland, emigrated in 1917 to Canada, spent several years uh, serving the Episcopal Church in Canada, and then uh, about 1917 or so moved to Montana, where he also served a parish, and for a time began teaching at the University of Montana, and in 1920 moved to Grinnell, Iowa, where he accepted a position as assistant professor of speech and drama at Grinnell College. He stayed here until 1923. So he taught at the college, was a, a clergyman. At that time, as you'll see momentarily, the Episcopal Church sort of evaporated and disappeared, but there were a number of Episcopal, more than 100 students at the college uh, regarded themselves as Episcopal, Episcopalians, and he uh, held uh, mass, I guess you'd say, conducted the liturgy for them on the college on a regular basis. So this is another one of those things that, you know, who'd have thunk? But uh, there he is. Mm. So we've been there. <clears throat> well, um, for now. You know, in, in the beginning, if you think about, if you read very much about J.B. Grinnell and so on, um, you understand that he was a rather serious, rather pious man, and. Uh, he intended the community that he was mainly responsible for establishing to be a religious, pious community. Uh, many of you may know that the original land grants and so on specified that no alcohol was to be served on any of those uh, spaces of land that he made part of his original contract. Um, so we're, we're talking about somebody who was pretty serious. He was, a, uh, at least in many minds, he was a kind of radical uh, congregational minister. And he had in mind here to have uh, a kind of intentional community, an intentional religious and educational community. How did it work out? Well, if we go back to our old friend, the 1915 census, we find something that I thought at least was kind of surprising. If you look at those cards, and I'll show you some again in a few minutes. If you look at the cards, one of the categories says religious affiliation. And the thing that I found interesting to me was that almost half the people said nothing. Some actually said none, but a lot of others were sort of left blank. So in a way, I mean, okay, so more than half the people had one, but almost half had none. And this is not all that, to, remember, the community, the community was founded, let's say, around 1855, something like that. So uh, within, let's say, uh, 50 years, half century and so on, the character of the population already showed some considerable change. It didn't mean, however, it didn't mean that official Brunel had sort of given up on this. And you may find this a little bit surprising. This comes from the 1914 uh, headline in the Grinnell Herald, which established a day for everybody to get out and go to church. Now, it turns out, if you read the whole thing, uh, if you read here, 500,000 persons attended church in Chicago. This was the kind of uh, model that they were using. And, and then they went on to say, uh, let's see, where is it? Grinnell never lags behind. Choose your church and go. This is, this is a newspaper. You know, uh, part of the idea of understanding how the community was going to move forward was to say we also have this kind of religious preoccupation. Unfortunately, it wasn't so successful as they had hoped. Weather was behind it all, according to them, anyway. I don't know how much of this you can, you can make out. I can read part of it to you here. Uh, the newspaper reports attendance was not large. They actually went through each of the churches and inventory them. They said the Catholics had this many, the Congregational had this many, and so on. And they were able to come up with about 1,500 people who had shown up in church on Sunday morning. Uh, the houses of worship they went on were not overcrowded, but many new persons were in evidence in the audience. 
Attendance at the evening services was miserably small. <laughs> and it is doubtful 2,000 persons attended the church all day. Well, okay, an intentional religious community in a way that's not surprising. Some of you may have seen the exhibition over in the college library now that uh, John Handelson put together with the uh, archivists of the college, which compares the way in which the inspirationist community in Amana sort of coincided with the development of Grinnell. And they're different, of course, but also share some uh, similar aims and purposes. And it's interesting to think about what happened to these intentional religious communities over time. The newspaper went on to say, well, despite the fact that uh, you know, all this didn't work out very well, here's a newspaper article from 1915. Do I have the date here? 22 March 1915. And they were talking about the numbers of people who had joined the churches. And they actually went through the whole list of churches. And they said, uh, after the recent evangelistic services, read the paper regularly, you're going to see that there were uh, rotations of evangelists who passed through town and kind of stoked the fires for a while. Um, 130 were added to the Methodist Church and 60 baptisms, 100 added to the Congregational Church on Wednesday, and 90 more on Sunday, and so on. Um, part of the newspaper's function in a community like this was to kind of take the religious temperature of the community. And so we, we find this... Uh, this happening. If you break down, remember I said before that these cards are not all that they might, they add up to almost 6,000 cards, but some were duplicated and some were lost and so on. So these are only approximate numbers. But uh, any, any Methodists here? Okay, the Methodists win. <laughs> 1,000 Methodists, the Congregationalists, unfortunately, were trailing behind a little bit there, need a little extra, extra work. But then you see a rather considerable drop-off. Baptist, uh, Christian, the, the, the term is used here, I'm not clear on whether the, um, whether the census taker understood the Christian church as such, or did a person just say, well, I'm Christian, that is a non-denominational, so I'm not sure what this adds up to, but... Anyway, uh, 216 Catholic at this time, and then you see some of the others uh, trailing off into the smaller, smaller groups. If we look at this in a kind of graphic way, which illustrates the point, so here are the two largest, this is really a very little difference between the two largest denominations, and then lots of smaller groups here. But the thing which still catches my eye is this big lump over here, right? Uh, that's the nun, uh, and it's, uh, it's something that's useful to think about. Among the other, I couldn't chart all of these because often the numbers were very small, but it's interesting to see uh, who, what, what kind of religious uh, identifications people, uh, people made. Um, one of the ones I find interesting here, you remember I mentioned the Whitman of America last time, I think it was, we talked about uh, the case of John Lucas and so on. One of the Whitman of America, and actually the way that I first encountered this case, was a man by the name of Daniel Brainerd, who was a spiritualist. And he actually worshipped at a church up in Marshalltown, but at his funeral services and so on, a, a, a woman who was a, a medium, that's how she listed herself in the Marshalltown directory, came down to do the service. So, so we had a little bit of, of everything. Um, uh, I won't go through all these. You, you, know, uh, you know what most of them represent. I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, School education, I'm not sure. <laughs> if you look at the 1908 church direct, or excuse me, community directory, city directory, these are the churches who are listed. It doesn't mean that's the only forms of worship there were, but these are the ones that were acknowledged and identified in the, uh, in the directory. And you see just the kinds of ones that we expected here, of course, are uh, Congregationalists and the, the Methodists. Still called Methodist Episcopal, you folk can work this out for me later in, in the... Uh, uh, census forms. Some people reported themselves as Methodists and others, maybe because it was easier to write down M.D. as <coughs> Episcopal, but as I understand it, that, that's a, a, a distinction which uh, disappeared later. Yes, Jack? It dropped the Episcopal in 1939. 1939, the Episcopal was dropped. I'm not sure why. Uh, do you know why, Jack? Uh, they combined all of the, there was a, during the Civil War, they had divided, they had the Methodist Church South and several of them, and they put them all together and yeah, the long uh, history of, of collecting different uh, divisions of Methodist Church, particularly from the South and some of the years after the Civil War. In any case, the, the Methodists uh, here were obviously very important. The first Baptist Church was interesting. We'll look at it. Uh, you may know it was just down the street here, right where the dentist's office are now, dental associates and so on, a very large 
uh, Baptist church there. So in a way, it was close to the center with, uh, with some of the other churches. The Roman Catholic uh, Church south of town, and a smaller church in those days, uh, the Presbyterian, as I mentioned St. Paul's Episcopal, also south and rather small at the time, an Adventist uh, church, uh, their friends, German Lutheran, Latter-day Saints. That, that, is that the Ebenezer Lutheran Church? Mm -hmm. That was Norwegian, not German. Uh, well, actually, it goes back and forth in part because it disappears. The Ebenezer. My, father, my grandfather was helped establish that it was a Norwegian. The, the, the question was uh, the uh, German Lutheran Church. Don says it was actually Norwegian. The Ebenezer Norwegian. Uh, uh, yeah. I, the names, in fact, just have changed over time, and I'm not sure why. But uh, at this point, it was described as German Lutheran in the directory. So I'm just telling, telling you what they have. The 1910 directory, not much difference except the Friends Church disappears and we don't read about the Latter-day Saints or the Christian Science. Whether the, that was a function of the directory compiler missing it or they didn't get a deadline or what, I don't know, but they're not listed in the uh, 1910 uh, directory. By 1920, it's a little bit different. I mentioned already that St. Paul's Episcopal disappears. We'll have something to say about that in a moment. We'll also read nothing about the, the Latter-day Saints. But we do hear the Christian Science are meeting in the Stuart Library and, and the other groups of friends uh, have evidently in a different uh, address but very nearby still still meeting there. So let's take a look at some of the some of the churches. I'm actually doing two talks at once today, so neither one's going to be all that I hoped it would be, so I'm going to have to go as quickly uh, as I can. Many of these pictures will be familiar uh, to you. This is a, a typical old uh, representation of the early community, and this is the first of the, the churches. Uh, the Congregational Church that was founded sometime in 1855, 20 charter members. Uh, and that was part of what was intended to be the foundation for this intentional community, the Congregationalist. And uh, Grinnell himself, of course, was a Congregationalist, and many, uh, many of those who came to support him. By far and away, the most impressive structure of all of these that uh, we'll look at today is what's called the Old Stone Church, the Congregational Church was built between 1877 and 1879, and many of you will know it was pulled down in 1952, I think it was, uh, to be replaced by the current, uh, current church. What really impresses me are these towers. This tall tower here was 143 feet, and this one was uh, 88 feet. So uh, this was something you could see from everywhere. We're going to see that some of the other churches put up towers, but nobody beats this. Okay, that's, that's up at the top, and uh, it helped to distinguish the church from everything, everything else. This is the interior of the Congregational Church, and many of you will know that it served for a long time as the uh, place for college commencement, among other things. Um, it was a, an important place in town, uh, seated, uh, what did they say, about 850, this choir loft uh, seated another 40 or 45, something like that. So we're talking about a very large church uh, with their seating capacity intended to, uh, to address a large, uh, a large population. In 1911, the Congregational Church claimed a membership of more than 1,000 persons. Uh, that's in a community of, say, 5,000, something like that, a little more than 5,000. So you have some idea of the influence. And if you go through the list, as I did, the list of members and so on, and a lot of people I don't whose names I don't recognize, but a lot of the names I do recognize. The Congregational Church had a lot of people who uh, were influential, I'll put it that way, in Grinnell. Uh, B.J. Ricker, whom I've talked about before, Ricker was here, as was uh, David Morrison, and so on. Many of the people who were crucial to Grinnell in those years were members of the Congregational Church. So whether they were all pious or not, they were certainly connected <laughs> through, well, I mean, through the, through the church. So. The original uh, Methodist Episcopal Church was founded just a few years after the Congregationalists, around 1859, and met for a time in a store at 4th and Main, and then uh, they built this structure in the same place, just across the street here from where we are, uh, where the stone, you know, the, the current Methodist Church uh, now stands. You remember I talked about automobiles and muddy streets? Uh, getting, getting to church, especially if you had kind of a long dress on, you know, might have been a little bit of a, a little bit of a trick. But this was a frame, uh, a frame structure, uh, and uh, by 1874, the Methodists claimed that they had somewhere around 140 members. 
So it was a growing uh, community, but perhaps not, not quite as big as the, uh, as the congregational church. This is the church that's familiar to us right across the street here. This is a picture from 1918, but the building itself was actually built in 1895. And you remember we talked about uh, Robert Coots uh, last time. Coots was a stonemason who did most of the stone, stone work here and still, still stands, still a, a, remarkable, a remarkable building. Uh, the main tower here was only 68 feet. Uh, I watched when they re-roofed this, was it two summers ago, I watched those guys up there on that thing, I was very impressed, but that was only 68 feet, what they were doing up on the, the, old stone, uh, the old stone church. The seating capacity of the original octagonal auditorium was about 600, according to the records. Another 500 could be added in rooms that were uh, made intended for Sunday school and so on, which could be could be opened up. It was built at that time, 1895, for about $20,000. It sounds like a pitiful sum now, doesn't it? Uh, my car out there costs more than $20,000, right? But in 1895 dollars, that was quite a pile. Uh, and so you can see that it's a, a remarkable building. And here, if you look at the Sanborn map, here we are, we're right in here somewhere, except it's a different structure now. Of course, it's 1911, the Sanborn map. But here you see the uh, Methodist Episcopal Church uh, occupying a high and important, uh, important spot. This is the Baptist Church. This is a, uh, I'm not sure what the date of the photo is. The Baptists organized about the same time as the Methodists did, 1858. And their early meetings occurred about once a month in an old schoolhouse. They built a small building the following year at West and Second Street. <coughs> And 1864 moved to Fourth and Park, and this church, which we're looking at, was erected in 1890. So this was actually before the uh, Methodist Church of Stone, at least. There was a Methodist Church there, but the Stone Church was erected a few years uh, later. Um, in 1952, the Baptists moved to a new church. You know the one over on East and Fifth, yeah. right? East and Fifth, yeah. Um, and left this one behind, they transferred ownership for a while to the Glad Tidings Assembly of God, who met here for a time. But ultimately, of course, this building, uh, this building was torn, uh, torn down. So if you think about downtown again, we were just talking about, so here's the, the uh, Methodist Church, right? And here's the Baptist Church. If I had a bigger uh, map up, you would see the Congregational Church over here. So in the center of town, we had all these very visible churches, uh, with these towers sticking up, you know, and uh, in a way confirming what J.B. Grinnell had in mind for the town, that this would be a place that was fundamentally and intentionally religious. And the churches were a kind of uh, a confirmation of that. This is the interior of the Baptist uh, Church. Uh, like the others, I mean, uh, from the time, I suppose, it derives, uh, modern sensibilities look at this perhaps and think, well, it's kind of dark. But most of these uh, meeting places were, it's, it's how they were uh, designed at the time. These were all oak pews, tinted cherry, uh, an electric chandelier, and the main room was 54 by 59, all lined with yellow cypress. It was a fine, fine structure. I don't know, but I rather guess that J.B. Grinnell didn't imagine that Catholics would settle in this town. <laughs> That's only a guess. But they did come, uh, in part because the population was changing, because there was an increasing uh, flow of migration to Iowa and, and then further west and so on. So uh, although the Catholic community here began modestly, perhaps, uh, it prospered uh, over the course of time. The, the Catholic first record we have of a gathering, three Catholic families in 1870, gathered at a private home, John Smith, 3rd and West. By 1884, they had a building which was largely due to the generosity of one of the lumber merchants in town, B.J. Carney. Do you remember I mentioned Carney? We talked about Carney Row, where the Mexicans were living on State Street. Uh, B.J. Carney was a part of the Catholic uh, parish here and uh, apparently put his uh, money and his lumber behind the idea of building a church for, uh, for the Catholic community. They had no resident priest until 1913. It was a big deal in the history of the church when the first of the resident uh, priests arrived and uh, tended to then grow the church group rather dramatically after that. 
His first uh, Catholic church was uh, situated at the corner of Maine and Washington. So uh, again, so downtown, right, we've got the Methodists, we've got the Congregationalists, we've got the Baptists, but a little further south, away from the center, uh, we have the, the Catholic, uh, Catholic Church. The original church, if you remember that picture, uh, this has been enlarged, the entryway, the, the uh, what do you call it, narthex, I guess, uh, was enlarged, but perhaps most importantly, they built a rectory, a residence, for the priests in 1913. So again, we see more evidence of the Catholic Church putting down roots and becoming, uh, becoming more firmly established. The church that we know as the Catholic Church, St. Mary's, uh, just up the block here, <clears throat> was actually built in the 1920s. Uh, the acquisition of the properties began in 1922, and there was fundraising going on for several years. Uh, the building construction happened in 1926 at a cost of about $59,000. Um, $20,000 in the late 1800s for uh, the Methodist Church across the way. $59,000 uh, here. Uh, plus the cost of the land, which turned out to be uh, something else I want to talk about in a moment. The church was dedicated in 1927, and has. Uh, this is a somewhat later uh, picture, as you can tell, although not too much later. There's a 1930s, I would say, automobile, right? Uh, but you see the trees, these are the elms and so on, that were so common in town at the time. This is the interior. I apologize for the quality of this picture. It's my fault. I took it off of Xerox and it didn't come across very well. But perhaps you can get the idea. There were then, I think this is still true, 18 rows of pews on each side, seating about 360. So the congregationalists were anticipating somewhere around 1,000 people showing up, right? 850 to 1,000. And the uh, St. Mary's imagined something in the order of, of 360. So uh, not, not the main church in town anyway, but it is important, I think, to observe that the Catholics had moved from this more peripheral location right to the heart of town, and they had a very prominent and, and beautiful, in my opinion, uh, building there. So these were some of the dominant, uh, dominant churches. The Episcopal Church in town was always, uh, in, in, in its history, I mean, it was always small. This is actually a drawing that was done by Sarah DeLong. Many of you will remember Sarah, a very talented artist, now uh, moved to the, to the West. Uh, but she did this drawing, which is based on an early photograph we have of the, of the church. Um, first met in 1872. They met, like many of these other groups did, in various temporary facilities for a while, uh, YMCA rooms and and then later at some other uh, other sites. It was officially registered as a mission church in 1883. And the following year began work on a church building at what is now First and Main. Mm. I'm not going to be able to see this very well here. Mm. Can I see it a little better on the map here? Not too well. It's too light a, a message. But uh, this is First Street, right? And Main. And this is North, if that helps you. Okay, so it's this corner, the southwest corner, first and main. There's something else there now. The building, as you see momentarily, was, uh, was moved. But uh, that's where the Episcopal Church uh, resided. As their numbers grew for a time, the Episcopalians imagined building downtown. In other words, getting away from that edge of town, edge south, and getting closer to the center. And so they actually purchased some land. Now here, uh, here we're at Fifth and Broad, right? This is where St. Mary's goes up, all right? And here's the, the Methodist Church. The Episcopalians purchased 55 feet right here, <laughs> right? So their idea was to be on Fifth Street, kind of catty corner from the Methodists, and uh, to set up headquarters there. Um, unfortunately, it was just at that time that their numbers started to diminish. And you know, if you go through the records of the Episcopal Church, as, as I have done, uh, for these years, you find that for a time they continued to pay the, the, the monies that were expected from them to the diocese, but finally by 1920 had given up. They simply never came up with the money that was necessary to build in this, on this site. And so what happens is they actually sell this site to the Catholics for St. Mary's, and, and after that for almost 20 years we don't hear of an Episcopal Church in, uh, in Brunel. The Seventh-day Adventists uh, first assembled in Grinnell sometime before 1882, when the dozen or so founding members purchased land on the west side of the 400 block of Broad Street 
and built there this church, a framed church, 28 by 40. And by 1886, they said, uh, they claimed about 40 members or so. So it was a much smaller operation. In 1916, moved to Spring Street, 1110 Spring Street, and I'm not sure um, what happened after that. This is the location, this is the Adventist church here. So here's Broad and Hamilton, right? We're talking about territory that, uh, this is now territory occupied by Davis School. So it's just in that same neighborhood. This is the church that Don and I were talking about before, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, 1120, the seventh, basically seventh and, and L, still standing there, a beautiful, a beautiful church. Uh, the, the history of this is a little more contorted than I'm able to go through. This particular series of it apparently did not survive. Uh, in the 1930s, this chapel was built for what was then called the American Lutheran Church. These are the ancestors of St. John's. Uh, and this, which is for sale, by the way, if you want to buy this uh, property, you can uh, acquire it now. <laughs> the Friends Church uh, was located at West Street. I remember I mentioned that there were different numbers that were put up. I think this is about where, um, uh, the, what is it called, All Vet uh, Veterinary Clinic or something like that is located. Um, O'Reilly Auto Parts is on the end of that block. You know where we're, we're talking about? Uh, and I'm not, I can't get any, I've looked up and down that street. There is a building there between those two, but I can't find any number on it, so I don't know whether it's 625, but right in there in that zone is what we're talking about, was the Friends Church, which had, uh, of course, West Street as its, as its uh, location. This is, wait, I'm just repeating myself there. I better hurry, I'm not gonna, not gonna make this. Uh, so the Presbyterians were latecomers, as these things uh, go. Uh, in the early 1900s, 1902, I think, was the first record we have of their uh, gathering. And their first building was uh, this uh, frame structure, a chapel. It was built very close to where they currently are. So we're just talking about down the street here again. They were trying to stay close to the center, where all these other uh, big churches were. But by 1906, they had built this uh, building, which many of you will remember. Uh, the uh, long-time uh, Presbyterian uh, church, a brick, I don't know, Grecian or classical style, I guess, intended to seat about 300 persons. Um, 1906, it cost $9,000 to build. Uh, a bargain. Uh, a bargain, I think. Very quickly, moving on, the, the Church of Christ uh, actually purchased the Episcopalian's church. In fact, you, this is a bad picture over here, but this part of it was the Episcopalian Church. Can you see this little color difference here? Uh, they added onto it and moved the building to uh, south, where am I here? To south of the Ricker Glove Factory. So they're on Broad Street in that kind of park area that's now open to the south of the, of the uh, college's office building there. That's where the Church of Christ was located. They had ambitions of building and starting all over again, and the newspaper in, in 1923 had this drawing of what they imagined their new church would be like. I, I find the drawing astonishing. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know what to say about it. I don't know what style that is, but anyway, that was that was what they uh, that was what they thought they might have. And you know where they expected it to be? Okay, so here's Broad Street, right? Here's Sixth Avenue. You know what's there now? Pizza Hut. Uh, that's the lot that they intended to use uh, at that corner. It never happened. And you read later that the, the church, when it was still uh, functioning, said, well, we bought the property and so on, but anybody who wants to park there when they're downtown, remember all the cars, what cars meant to town, so you can feel free to park there. And so they left it as a kind of parking lot for a time, but it, it, uh, the church was never, never built there. You remember I mentioned that a service station went in across the way here? Uh, that was another one of those things. Something really happened on the other side of the street, but the pizza hut lot remains sort of un, uh, unattended. Many of you will, will know and recognize this building still standing, a lovely structure in the former uh, Spencer House on uh, 6th Avenue. Uh, there were 12 charter members, according to the record, in 1898 who met uh, downtown. By 1900, they were meeting in rooms above Child's Studio on Broad Street. Child's Studio was one of those uh, buildings that was pulled down when um, the bank, uh, the bank ex expanded. Um, and then in 1932, they acquired land on 6th Avenue and moved the Spencer House there. Um, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to uh, go quickly. 
the, the, there certainly was an organization of Latter-day Saints, uh, but it never, I think, flourished here. Uh, I think today there's, there's a chapel in Newton, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, not one here. Uh, there was a Universalist uh, group, and um, you, you can imagine that their, their, uh, the bond of union here was something we would have recognized, uh, recognized anyway. I think we're, we're at uh, time here. I'm, I have a feeling I'm not going to get through everything today, but uh, let's take, uh, take a break and we'll come back and resume uh, this, okay? Thank you. Thank you for returning to your seats. It's a lot of people to get back to stroke again. We appreciate your cooperation. I wanted to mention to you too about the ACES courses is that there is no tuition fee. The college takes care of that for you. So it, the reason we need the registration is to give a general idea of how many people to expect so we know how many people to set up the room for, how many refreshments to order, how many handouts to have, and that sort of thing. But if you are ready to come and a friend of yours says, oh, I wish I had registered for that, say, come along anyway, because it's not that close to count. So now we're back to the second half of Dan's uh, class. Charlie Duke was reminding me at break, or he telling me, actually, I didn't know this, that uh, Grant Gale knew Albert Baez, Joan's uh, mother. And not only that, but Grant and Albert Baez had spent a sabbatical together in Iraq in 1950. So, you know, things come together. It's fun to, fun to hear about those and discover them. Uh, Joanne just mentioned the second half. I think I need three second halves to finish up what, I've, what I've got here, so I'm not sure how I'm going to do that. I'll do the best that I can. I may hurry up a little bit here, so please forgive me if I, if I rush over uh, rush over things. But one of the things that I wanted to follow up on that we talked about last week, I thought a lot about the subject matter that we discussed last week as Baltimore has gotten more uh, troubled. And uh, one of the things I thought maybe we should take a look at is uh, how difference in the way in which we talked about last time, racial or color difference and so on, might have impacted what happened uh, in, in the religion, the, the church world. And uh, the question I asked was, did Grinnell churches embrace the African American and Mexican residents of Grinnell? And the answer seems to be yes. I'm not sure I would have predicted that, but that seems to be, uh, seems to be the case. And here I'll show you a few uh, of these cards that we talked about before. Remember I mentioned John Lucas, um, who ends up uh, dying in California. Uh, actually, he had many occupations in his life, but he became a kind of minister towards the end of his life. He officiated at several of the funerals of African Americans here in town, but uh, he described himself as, uh, as a Methodist. Uh, Mary Redrick, remember they lived on Center Street, Mary Redrick was unusual in describing herself as a Baptist. In all the records that I could find, she was the only African American in town who described herself as, uh, as Baptist. George Craig described himself as friends here, uh, and I'm not sure about, remember, uh, George uh, Craig was born in slavery and came here from South Carolina, I think it was, um, but uh, perhaps, uh, certainly, uh, there was a reason for him to do so, as we'll see in a moment. Fidencio Estrada, remember the Mexican uh, groups that we talked about before? She identified herself Catholic, and many of the families, the Mexican families, identified themselves as, uh, as Catholic. Not all Mexicans did, however. There were a number of men who were here as singles, uh, living a kind of bachelor life, as far as we know, and one of them was Joe Garcia, and you see he's uh, blank. He has no religious affiliation, and that was common among uh, among the, the singulars. Mumford Holland does not show up in the, at least I couldn't find him, in the 1915 census. Uh, and I was curious to know about him and what his religious orientation was. His obituary uh, concludes, remember we talked about the obituary with people poking fun at him and so on, and his deferential manner and all the rest of it. Well, uh, the con it concludes with, was converted and joined the Salvation Army in the early 1880s and remained an earnest, an earnest member of that organization all the rest of his life. We don't hear a lot about the Salvation Army and the records that survive, but clearly it played a part in town, especially for somebody uh, like Mumford Holland. And was any one church more likely than another to welcome Grinnell's African-Americans and Mexicans? 
And the answer seems to be uh, perhaps, or a qualified yes. Uh, the Methodist appears more often in the 1915 census records among African Americans as well as among the rest of the town residents. Nevertheless, we might, we might worry a little bit about the accuracy of that record. And the reason I say that is because Eliza Craig was very clearly known to have been raised Quaker. Uh, remember, I told her story very uh, briefly when she, she was born to a slave family in uh, the Carolinas, I think it was. Her father arranged for her to be transported to Ohio where Quakers helped her, uh, they, they raised her, and so she grew up in that uh, religious uh, identification, that religious faith, before she ever came to, uh, came to Iowa. And we know furthermore from her uh, obituary, uh, this is 1923, I think it was, I didn't write the year down, adopted the Quaker faith when a child and kept that faith all her life. So here's Thackeray. Remember I mentioned before Thackeray, the, the census record. I don't know, did he just get in the habit of writing Methodist? And you know, Eliza Gray, he must be a Methodist. And, uh, I don't know, but th they may not all be accurate, but certainly uh, Methodist shows up uh, very often. Um, here are many of the other cases I can show you. If you remember uh, L.A. Renfro, the uh, cook at the Monroe Hotel, among other things, and here he describes himself uh, as a Methodist. But it's interesting, uh, his children, you know, we're looking at 1915, his children thought otherwise. You, you ever had that experience with your children? <laughs> if I think you should do something, then no, we're doing an absolute opposite. So the Renfro, Mr. and Mrs. Renfro were both identified as Methodists. But it's interesting that their children said, we're Congregationalists. Uh, so that here, I remember I, I said that Thackeray had spelling problems. Here's Alice. Uh, we'll see a, see a couple more of these. But she said, no, Congregationalist. Here's Helen, two L's. Uh, Helen, you remember who goes on to be the valedictorian in 1923, I think it is, from Grinnell High School. Helen, who's 11 years old, right, says none. Right? So... Uh, the, we have a sense here of a kind of independence, perhaps, not just sort of following on whatever they are, you know, trying to that. No, I've got my own, my own mind here. So let me try to sum up, uh, what, what do I want to say here? This is very hurried and I apologize for that, but to me, anyway, surprisingly, the large proportion of the town's residents were indifferent to religion, okay? So these are, what are the take-home points? This is one that I would say. Surprisingly large proportion were indifferent to religion. Among the churchgoers, Methodists and Congregationalists predominate. Not really a surprise, is it? But uh, something now we have some kind of evidence to, to sustain. And almost from the beginning, various other usually smaller religious communities were organized. And finally, Grinnell's African-American and Mexican families embraced churches in Grinnell. Not all of them, as I said, particularly uh, bachelors, singles, and so on, not necessarily, but families seem to have. Okay, so that was what I had hoped to finish before we got to break, so now I've got to uh, kind of get out of that. Pardon me for a minute while I just switch. I wanted to say something about schools. I said at the first session, I think, that there was so much conversation in town about schools. Remember, this was just before, the, or just after, was it the bond issue, and all the discussion about new buildings, and how do you teach students better, what's the best success. So I thought these are materials that might be of some interest, and I'm going to have to go through them fairly uh, fairly quickly, I guess, but um, we'll try to make, make some use of it. <clears throat> uh, you know, you've been through that routine. Okay, so what were the schools in Grinnell a century ago, and where were they? Let's take a quick look at the schools, and then I want to look at the uh, interior. This is the list of those schools that would have uh, existed, or just most of the time, anyway, that we're looking at into the teens. Uh, Center and South were the old schools, and then Parker and Cooper were relatively new in the period we're talking about. Davis Elementary was built brand new in the teens, uh, 1917. Uh, high school in 1904, and then the junior high, or even adjacent, in 1921. Let's take a quick look at the, at the schools themselves. <clears throat> this is Center School, 911 Park, <clears throat> which is uh, just down the corner here across the street from, from where we are. Um, looks kind of like a house, right? But what should a school look like? I happened to drive by uh, Fair, Fairview School this morning, and I was struck that the sun was shining on the brick, and so on. It's a one-level thing with all this sort of spread out across the zone. That's one way of thinking about schools, right? And here we have another way. You know, I said, well, that's kind of like my house, you know, my big house. 
And these big tall windows and big tall ceilings and so on, uh, that's kind of what uh, center school was. They had six teachers, and here they taught grades six, seven, and eight. Although six and seven, for a large time, also were taught at Davis. So this school served as a kind of, a, it, it was a funnel from Parker and Cooper, and then later from Davis. But Parker and Cooper students came, came together first. So you know where it is, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit here. South School was located down just where we were mentioned before by uh, Davis. And this too looks for all the world like a house, doesn't it? Has this kind of a Queen Anne type uh, tower on the corner of its own. But this was the, uh, the school in South, the corner of Hamilton and Broad. And it was, as I said, demolished and replaced by Davis School in 1917. So this is essentially, this, it, it functioned as Davis School. Now, uh, this is the, the map that shows you where it is. So here's Broad and Hamilton. This is square in the, in the lot of where Davis School is now. These, there were houses here. This is the play yard and so on. Now, so that territory, uh, you know. Parker School is also gone now. It was gone before we got to town. It was built in 1896 <clears throat> and named in honor of Grinnell College professor and former superintendent of schools, L.F. Uh, Parker. Uh, it replaced the former Northwest School, which was destroyed by the fire in the 1890s. And this was pulled down in 1971, uh, making way for the old fairway uh, store, uh, but now is the location of the public safety building on the 6th and Spring, I think it is, uh, Street. Here's the map. I'm going to skip it because I'm running, running behind. Cooper School was here when we hit town in 1979. Uh, Cooper School was built in 1899. It was named in honor of Colonel Cooper, who had commanded Grinnell troops in the Civil War. <clears throat> it was closed and sold in 1974. When we came to college, you could walk past it and you could see mattresses and so on blocking the windows. It was a storage house for a long time before the college moved those things out and then, and then pulled the building down. Uh, both the Kennedy schools, uh, Parker and uh, Cooper School, had six teachers in them kindergarten through fifth grade. And those six teachers included a principal, and the principal had a grade also. So there wasn't anybody sitting behind the desk with a secretary and, you know, phone to the, they were in the classrooms and, and doing, uh, doing their things. It's worth mentioning here, I can't go into any detail on this, but one of the things that impressed me when I first started uh, looking at these materials was that Grinnell had kindergarten. Uh, at the turn of the century, there were a lot of places that didn't have it. It was still very controversial. The idea that you should, you know, can you teach kids that little, and what are you going to do about it? And so, but Grinnell had it. It had it in all the schools, and I think that's a tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, contribution and an important one. So you know where Cooper is. This is the high school. It was built in 1904. I guess most of this is still standing, sort of. You can uh, kind of recognize it, even though those photo. I, I don't know if you can tell, this is an early photo. Can you see what this is right here? It's a horse and boat. Oh. And here you can see on the side another one. And this railing goes along here. That's to tie up your horse whenever you got it up there. So this is the year that we're looking at. Remember I said 1904, there were, I can't remember, was it four or five cars or something like that in town? So there weren't a lot of cars lining up along there, uh, not at that time, but, uh, anyway. So, to go back to our map, you remember looking at this, here's the Methodist Church, and here's the Baptist Church, so here's the high school. So, you know, J.B. Grinnell, part of his original idea was that religion and education should somehow be molded, and in a way, the central quadrant of the town reaffirmed that thing. Yeah, there was the school, and there were the churches, and that's what, uh, how you could come to think about, come to think about the town. This is, of course, Davis uh, School, which was new in uh, 1917. One of the things, when, when I first looked at this, I had Jill used to teach at Davis, she's a student taught at Davis and so on, so I was over there quite a lot, but I, I never looked at it quite the same way. One of the things that strikes me is, look at all these windows. They're huge. Uh, they're huge windows, and they brought a tremendous amount of light into the classrooms. If you look at some of the interior pictures of the other, the older classrooms and so on, it was dark in there. Uh, and I don't know quite, I don't understand it, even in the, in the, the like Cooper School, where they had very large windows, they had shutters to cover off a lot of it, so a lot of the interior was very dark. And I don't, I don't, I don't understand. But then, of course, there came a whole other time, and somebody said, well, you know, this is a lot of energy going on here, let's try to close off all those and uh, 
uh, several of the schools, Bailey and, and Fairview, both have all that stuff sort of blocked up, and so things change over over time and how that and how that happens. You know where uh, where Davis is. So I'm not going to. Uh, this is a fairly modern picture. I don't have a date on it. I'm guessing 1970s, maybe something like that. Here we see the new Congregational Church. So we're way past the 1950s, and the Baptist Church is long gone. There's the Dental Associates office over there, right? But this is the uh, junior high. This is now kind of parking lot. And so most of this was taken away when the community center was made out of the schools. So most of this stuff was destroyed and is now uh, now missing. But it was a big uh, a big building. And this replaced, of course, the old center school. Remember there was the first or second picture I showed you? There was that frame building in the center that's now, uh, now gone. One of the issues that came up in the conversation about the... Um, bond issue recently was the whole idea of neighborhood schools. That kids should be able to walk through a neighborhood school, they shouldn't have to go so far, shouldn't have to be bused across town and so on. And the era that we're talking about now, uh, neighborhood school philosophy prevailed. This is a representation, uh, I spent a lot of time working on the Rickers, so this uh, spots where the other children in the Rickers uh, entry into kindergarten in 1919, where they live. Okay, so uh, here is the school. This is Cooper School. That's where they went. So these are the kids who are just south of 6th and then up into the northeast quadrant. And here are the Ricker twins. They were sort of the outliers. But you see that, that there, if nothing on the other side of the tracks, right, all up in that, in that corner. Whereas if you look at that same year, what the kindergarten distribution was like at Davis School. Okay, so it's everything south of the tracks. Right? So here's Davis School. See the little star there? It doesn't show up very well. But each of these green dots represents an address for one of the students in kindergarten. So th there really was a way in which the schools were organized according to the geography of the town. This is uh, fourth grade. Uh, it's kind of a long story. I'll mention this a little bit later. But the Ricker twins were transferred in uh, fourth grade, I guess it was. They were transferred over to Parker School. And these are where all their classmates lived uh, at the time. This is the Rickers, again, up here on North Broad Street. And you notice there is one individual below the tracks here, one of their classmates, but everybody else is up here on this side. And it's, it's you know, uh, there are lots of good reasons for having neighborhood schools, and one of them is this notion of convenience. They did not have buses, you know, the bus barns and arranging all the drivers and gasoline and all. They didn't have any of that, uh, but other kinds of things. Uh, intervene. Uh, what about class size? That's another thing to talk about, right? If you're going to build a school, how, how big should the classrooms be? And how many chairs do you want to fit in there? And how are you going to most effectively uh, conduct a class? I counted this. I love this picture. This is outside of Cooper's school. This is the front door to, to Cooper's school. And I don't know if you count it all up. I think you come around 15, 18, something like that. Uh, they all look like cute uh, kids. I wonder who the teacher was. It's a good idea in wintertime to sit out there and see these hats and we'll take your picture. How'd they get them all to sit still for that long? I, I can't imagine. I did a little calculation. I had access for a while to the microfilmed versions of the teacher's grade books. Okay? Now, the microfilm didn't always perform the way that I wished it were, so I couldn't read all of it, but I read quite a, quite a few of them. And of those that I could read, I tried to calculate the class size. So if you look in Davis School, the year 1919, 1920, I was able to read about 13 different classrooms. And those 13 classrooms averaged about 20 students a class. I mean, that's a good number. I mean, that's a, that's a, today, in a lot, of, a lot of school districts, I'm not sure what the number is here today, but 20 per classroom would be a, a kind of a marvel. When the uh, Ricker twins entered kindergarten at Cooper School, they had 16 in their class. <clears throat> when they were in first grade, the following year also at Cooper, they averaged, they had 21, uh, I think it was one semester, 20 the next semester. So we're talking about 20, again, about 20 students in the classroom. Um, when they were in fifth grade at Parker School, their class had only 14 in it. You know, uh, I, what I want to say about this is we need a more systematic study of all of the classes, certainly, but it sure looks like a lot of students went to school with relatively few students in the classroom, meaning they got more attention than they would otherwise. Yeah. 
right? If you, some of you here I know have been teachers in zone. When you've got a classroom full of kids, and especially when there are a couple of kids that maybe aren't as obedient as you might wish them to be, it can be really trouble. And the kids who don't cause any trouble are sort of left aside, and it can be, a, it can be an issue. Uh, for a center, the school eventually was replaced by the junior high. The average came in at about, uh, at about 17. So, uh, what does it all uh, boil down to? The data are incomplete, right? I admit that these are numbers you don't want to uh, bank on, but they're pretty close, I think. And they indicate that in the early 1920s, Grinnell mean classroom size was low. And that's a circumstance which I think most people would say is helpful to both teachers and students. One of the questions that came up last time, I think, was were the classrooms integrated? We talked about African Americans in town and Mexicans in town. What, what did that mean in the classrooms? Did students there experience that difference that we were, uh, we were talking about? And the answer seems to be yes, but. And the but has to do with the fact that we have neighborhood schools. Do you remember I showed you where everyone was living, where the African Americans were living, where the Mexicans were living in Kearney, Rowan, and so on? Almost all of them inevitably, therefore, went to Davis School. All right. So it meant that if you went to Cooper or Parker, in elementary school, pretty much guaranteed that you did not encounter anyone different from yourself. Okay. So I said that. So here, here are a couple of uh, examples. The year that the Ripper twins entered kindergarten over here at Cooper School. In Davis Elementary, the kindergarten included Edith Renfro, all right, one of the Renfro uh, family, Asuncion Ortiz and Victoria Ortiz. So in that one classroom, they had three children of color. The second grade included Jose Duran, Castula Espinosa, and Simon or Simon Torres. In third grade, there was Espinosa's sister, Esperanza, uh, Torres' sister, Sarah, and sixth grade, Evan L. Renfro. That's Justin Davis. Okay? If you did the same thing that year in Cooper, you get a big zero. Which means that the kids in Davis, were, when they were in the halls or they went to the restroom or, or recess and so on, they were encountering people of difference, uh, which was not true in the, in the other, uh, other two schools. At center, and then later at the junior and senior high schools, all the students were merged, and there you did get more of a mixing. I've mentioned several times already that Helen uh, Renfro graduated not just with her class, but as a valedictorian of her class at high school. So there, uh, once you've gotten through elementary school, you're more likely to encounter uh, individuals of, of difference. But uh, in the early going, uh, early going, not so much. One of the questions much discussed nowadays, and not only in educational journals and so on, is whether or not uh, students are receiving as much help from their teachers as they might. Are teachers holding them to sufficiently rigorous standards? And you sometimes hear discussions about something called social promotion, right? That is to say that uh, it would be hard on, you know, I don't know, Susie's ego or something like that if you held Susie back from all her friends and didn't promote her into the next grade. Better to promote her even if She's not doing quite as well as you might like in order to help keep her together, then maybe we can see if we can add it. Well, it creates, among other things, whole categories of education they didn't know about. I said they had six teachers in each of these schools. None of them was called special education. None. Uh, that is to say, every teacher had responsibility for that classroom that they were in, and no more and no less. So in a way, that affected how the teachers thought about what to do with the students in front of them. And the records that I looked through, at least all of those that I could read, indicate that the teachers in the Grinnell schools in those days did not shrink from retaining students. They did not practice, as far as I can tell, they did not practice uh, social promotion. In, in those days, I don't know when this began or when it ended, each elementary grade was divided into halves. The first semester was B, so if you were in first grade, you would begin in the fall in 1B. And if you succeeded, then you were promoted to 1A, right? And then if you were promoted, the next time you'd be promoted to 2B, and so on. But the interesting thing is that there was, in fact, a promotion between each half year. So that it wasn't just a matter of, well, he didn't do very well in the fall, but in the spring, got it worth it. 
you had to, to, to meet the requirements at the middle of the year in order to get into the second half. So the teachers were involved in two processes of evaluating, uh, evaluating their students. So, okay, I said that. So uh, you're not going to be able to make this out. I'm going to interpret for it. This is a page, a typical page. I tried to get one where you could actually see something, but as you see, you can't see all that much. But this category over here, this column over here, indicates the promotion. Okay, so this is second, if you see that second semester, 19, what year did I say here? 1923, spring of 1923. And this, uh, these are all the grades for the students, the various categories are listed up here. And then in the end is whether or not they're promoted and or not. Can you read this last one? This is retained. Uh, this one's also retained, and so most you can see up here are promoted, but uh, that's what the teacher had to do every semester. So it was a kind of final total, you know, final calculation uh, every semester. So was there a social promotion? Evidently not. And here, let me just give you a few, uh, a few examples. Cooper School in the first grade, 1920-21, this was the Rickers uh, twins were in this grade. That's why I have this information, I guess. But uh, in their class, they had uh, 22 uh, students. 18 were promoted to 1A, and four were retained in 1B. So in the middle of the year, the teacher said, well, what, that's almost a quarter, 20%, something like that. No, you're not going on to the next, next level. You're going to stay, stay with me. In the second semester, they were already thinned down a little bit, right? So it was going to be 20 students. 18 were promoted into 2B, but one was retained in 1B and one moved away. So the teachers were involved in this process of a kind of constant sorting, sorting out. Now here's a larger class, it's the largest class that I found, I think, at uh, first semester of kindergarten, had 27 students. Kindergarten, okay, I don't know what they were doing in kindergarten, but, you know, they weren't writing physics textbooks or something like that, it was fairly modest, I think. But the teacher said, well, okay, 18 of you have your colors straight, or whatever it is that they used to, right? Four didn't. And they said, no, you're staying with me, you're right here. Three were removed, and I don't know what this means. Actually, that's uh, two of the Mexican uh, students, the Ortiz. Remember I mentioned the Ortiz uh, daughters or uh, girls? Um, and I'm guessing, this is only a guesswork, that they did not speak English. And I'm guessing that they were having trouble because they were Spanish speaking. This was their first experience, perhaps, in an English speaking environment. But that's only a guess. Uh, I don't know what the drops were. But anyway, uh, you know. How did things go in class? Wow, you know, you went on to the next level, and you know, you've forgotten a few people who used to be used to be part of your uh, classroom. There were some special cases that I encountered. Um, I have no idea what this was. These are the words of the teacher in Cooper 2A, 1922. One student was especially promoted to 3B. I don't know whether the principal came in and said, look, this is kind of a tough situation, so we're just going to, you know, push this person on. I, I have no idea, but that's what the teacher wanted to somehow or another uh, distance herself, I think, from the obligation, and that's how she... Uh, another one can't make 3B without some tutoring. Uh, who knows what, uh, what happened. The Ricker children also seem to have constituted a special case, and I'd love to know what happened here, but I don't. Uh, it's very interesting uh, to read. Um, the, the Ricker twins, not even on the same day that this happened, I don't know, fall semester 1922, okay, they were in 3B, and at the end of September, Edward, the boy, was promoted to 3A. A few days later, Elizabeth, his sister, was promoted to 3A. What the hey? I mean, what's, what's that all about? I have no idea. Uh, and then, so they were in the 3A for just a little bit, and then they were transferred, or promoted to 4B and transferred to Parker School. So did something happen? Did, you know, did they get beat up in the playground? Or, or did, did, there was no record. Another thing that's interesting about these books is the teachers kept a record of who the parents were who came and when they came. So on the back of each one, so some parents are there pretty regularly, some not so much. The Rickers came pretty regularly, but they are not listed in this, uh, this record book. I can imagine, you know, B.J. Ricker coming in and saying, well, you know, listen, <clears throat> my twins are really pretty special. As a new grandpa, I can imagine myself doing that. <laughs> but we have no record that that's in fact what happened. So something intervened to cause them to push it. This was the principal, by the way, there was a teacher this time, Myrtle Parks, if I have time, I'm going to show you a picture of Myrtle Parks, what was their teacher at the time. And she decided that they were not going to stay in this classroom. Um, but why, we don't. Oh, I don't know. If you know, you let me know uh, 
We have to say a few words about the teacher. Uh, teachers, I should say, much more because uh, teachers are important. Uh, as a former teacher, again, I, I think about this. That they, they make so many contributions. And we're so lucky to have an educational system that helps our children adapt to a, to a, new, uh, to a new world. Uh, teachers, at the time that we're looking at, I think may have been even more dedicated than the teachers we have today. And I'm, I'm not sure of all the circumstances, I'd like to know more about that. But one of the things that's pretty clear when you look at the list is they were almost all women. At least until you get to the high school. They were almost all women. And an additional fact of uh, no coincidence is that they were almost all single women. Because I'm told, I, I actually never didn't find this written, but it must be true, uh, because they couldn't teach if they married. You know, this is a little bit like, in the time anyway, this is no disrespect to teachers today either, but it's a little bit like joining a monastic order or something, right? Your bride is Christ, they say, when you, when you enter a, a convent or something, right? So in this case, your bride is Jimmy and Joni, or whoever it is, and you're great. So uh, many of these women, therefore, ended up having uh, long careers. Uh, and they taught for decades. Now, that still happens. I know that still happens, but uh, the, some of the, uh, I'm going to just show you a couple of these very quickly, some of these uh, perhaps longer than others. Myrtle Parks, I mentioned a little while ago, uh, began teaching in Grinnell in 1908 at Parker School. <clears throat> she transferred to Cooper in 1911 and soon became the principal there, where she was for many years. She retired in 1949. Yeah. So that's more than four decades. Uh, of teaching here, and a person who, uh, who obviously made a big difference. Her parallel in, uh, ba in Parker School, excuse me, was uh, Nettie Bailey, um, who began teaching in Grinnell in 1909, was the year uh, difference, and retired the same year as Parks, 1949. She was a Grinnell High School graduate. She attended Grinnell College. She was a member, but not a graduate of the class of 1900. She was very active, among other things, in the Methodist Church. I, I went over to the uh, church last year sometime because Nettie Bailey's uh, will had included, a, I think it was a $1,000 bequest to the Methodist Church, and I asked whether anybody over there knew anything about it, and the short answer was no, <laughs> unfortunately. But she was very active over there. One of the materials that I used in preparing the uh, talk about the churches and so on was a uh, then she was active in the, the historical side of the historical museum. She put together an album of photos of churches in town and so on. It's compiled by Nettie Bailey, a very, uh, very important person here in town. Yes. Uh, Ruth Payne was also a Grinnellian. She was a graduate of the class of 1913 from Grinnell High School. Uh, I love this picture. This comes from the Grinnell yearbook of 1913. She and her sister were both long-term teachers here. Um, she graduated from what is today UNI, a state teacher school, what it called, something like that. Iowa State Teachers. Iowa State Teachers. And she began teaching in Grinnell in 1915 and retired in 1960. And is buried, uh, buried up here at Hazelwood. Some others, not so much. Florence Crawford was one of the teachers of the twins, the Ricker uh, twins, and she grew up in Kilman. She was actually born, I think, down in Brooklyn. But then her family moved up to uh, Kilman. Uh, she went to Gilman Schools and then the State, uh, State Teachers College, and she was soon back here teaching in Grinnell. But she's one of those persons who decided, this is not for me. And we know that, uh, I can't remember now, I think it's the 1930 census, has her working as a secretary in Des Moines. Uh, she changed uh, things. She moved back here for the last few years of her life. She lived uh, here in Grinnell and buried uh, up here in uh, Gilman, but uh, not, uh, not perhaps uh, as taken with the process as as, uh, so, uh, very quickly then, what can we say about schools? I'm sorry, there's a lot more we could say about this, but I'm going to try to get uh, it done. Well, then, is now school buildings matter. And I think it's still, you know, I said something about the darkness in some rooms, the light. And so I think these things do matter. People say, well, it's not the buildings, it's the teachers. You know, it's the teachers, but space matters too, I think, in important, important ways. And it's worth observing, I think, that the uh, school district in these years built a series of pretty expensive and pretty snappy schools. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of Parker and Cooper and then Davis later on. So it does, uh, it does happen and, and we have to be aware of that as we think about our own, uh, our own future. A second take home point that I'd like to leave with you is mean class size, 
seems to have been small. And that's something that people generally think is a good thing. And these folks, and you say, well, the stupid past, remember me talking about the stupid past? Not so stupid, right? At least I think this is not so stupid and worth, worth being complimented for. Also, it appears that the schools were integrated, although, as I said, the majority of all students of color attended Davis for elementary school. So neighborhood, the idea of neighborhood schools had the kind of inevitable effect of also segregating the elementary schools. And this is something, if you think about it, that's basically what's happened all over the country. That's how busing got going in the first place. And so was to try to overcome the fact that people who lived well and all their houses were pretty big and their, their neighborhood school was for those kids. And the people who lived in kind of less happy circumstances, that was their neighborhood school. But that meant, of course, that you effectively segregated one from the other. Promotions seem to have been carefully weighed and not so much what today we would call social promotion. I told you about the Rickers, I don't know, there, there's at least one case I can think of, maybe there were more than that, but there was a lot, a lot that seems not to have uh, succumbed to that. The teachers were overwhelmingly female and single, and many had long careers in the classroom, and I don't doubt that they were not paid sufficiently for all the dedication that they gave but we're lucky to have had them, and many of you, I suspect, had some of these people, or at least knew some of these teachers, and uh, we're very grateful for all that they've, all that they've done. I'm sorry I, I'm rushed here, but uh, I really appreciate everything that you've done. Thank you so much. <laughs> We sat and listened with misty eyes and sometimes watering eyes, right? Considering this creature that was a dominant feature of life back then, the good horse. And this is the important end, it seems, a lot of the time. <laughs> And I have a little poem for you. Trotting out Grinnell's secrets. We have looked back with wistful eyes at life as lived of yore. We think it must have been quite swell to once have lived before. Life was slow paced and so serene. The pace was slow and easy but didn't realize the breeze could make folks somewhat queasy. <laughs> you introduce us to fun facts about this town of ours, about race, schools, and daily life, and horses, streets, and cars. But then we don't miss other things that make life not so nice. The smells, the mud, and oh, the flies that lead to this advice. Be happy you live in the now, all clean and fresh and pure. We're confident that we won't step in a pile of fresh manure. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dan. And I'm telling you, that little guy is one lucky grandbaby. <laughs> uh, next week will be our last class for this uh, season of the bucket courses. So I'm hoping to see you all back. And Byron Huffle Worley will be talking about the cyclone of 1882. So I know you will enjoy that. You can leave your pieces of cardboard. Uh, whatever, pens and so on, on the table in the hall, and we'll take care of it for you. Thank you for coming this morning. We'll see you next week.